All right, good morning, everybody. Who's ready to rock? Feels like I'm on a real stage, like a stage stage. Well, this is uh, our title, Hackers, Hooligans, Heist, and History. Hopefully you're in the right spot. Um, I actually gave a talk similar to this at Black Hat last year, and some people approached me and said, hey, it would be really cool if you took a bunch of your stories and kind of worked it into a, a single presentation. So that was sort of the, the uh, idea behind this, uh, this talk. Um, a, a little bit about me, only because I think it's pertinent to this specific talk. Uh, so I've been in security for about 20 years. Um, started with DISA, then later in Bell Labs, moved to Brazil. I uh, worked there for about a year. I used to cover emerging markets, so Africa, Eastern Europe, uh, Southeast Asia, all over Latin America. So I've worked in about 50 different countries. Um, and I've helped build a, a number of companies. So Riptech, Artsite, Solera, Imperva, a couple others. I'm on the board of a few companies, Jasp, Silence, Aptome, things like that. So I've seen a few things. And through this time, I've collected a few stories. I've written a couple books. I wrote my last book with the director of the NSA. And I just did a documentary on cyber war with General Michael Hayden, former head of the CIA and the NSA. So a lot of the stories have a little bit of sort of nation state context to it. And uh, if you can't tell, because I'm standing by the podium, out of those 50 countries, most of them are pretty high in carbohydrates. So uh, just uh, <laughs> FYI. Um, quick raise of hands. Who here feels we live in probably one of the most technologically advanced times in, in human history, right? Not a trick question, I think, right? Most of us would agree. But the interesting thing about tech is, well, two things really, it's not really a linear progression. Every once in a while we come up with something that gives us a bit of a quantum leap. Um, and almost every time we invent something, somebody's trying to hack it in some way, shape, or form. And this isn't something that's just new to the digital age. And one of the examples I, I, I like to share is this one. It's Joseph Marie Jacquard. And he invented the automatic loom. Now, this was something that was used in the textile industry. And they were able to move from making about a dozen blankets a day to making hundreds of blankets a day. right? And it was arguably the world's first computer, a mechanical computer. And as you can tell, it looks a lot like punch tape, right? The predecessor to punch cards. So it had input, output, memory, et cetera, et cetera. So using this mechanical computer, it completely changed the manufacturing of textiles. And this was about 1804 to 1805. Now, I'm going to be giving out gift cards, $25 uh, gift cards throughout the presentation to get some audience participation. So the first one will be, who thinks they know how the employees probably reacted when this computer got brought in to, OK, yes, sir? Lies. They destroyed it because they're afraid to steal the job. Exactly, exactly. Hence the word sabotage, right? Saboteur, sabotage. That's where it came from. I always thought it was ironic that the world's first computer suffered an insider threat. So essentially, they thought, oh, this thing's making blankets faster than we can. Let's, uh, let's destroy it. And you're absolutely right. Oh, and by the way, anybody who gets one of these questions, just come up to, uh, to me at the end. My partner in crime over there is by the door. His name is Dixon Pike. Um, he's got the card, so we'll go ahead and get, get him to you afterwards. Awesome. And then we had another big quantum leap, and that was radio. And I think we've all heard of Marconi. So something interesting about Marconi, when he developed the radio, it was actually as a wireless replacement for standard wired telegraph, right? So in 1903, he goes to the Royal Academy of Science, and it's like a big deal, an auditorium probably 10 times the size, right? And he's sitting up there, and he's, his mom's there, and the press is there, and Jill Harilla, the girl he asked to the junior prom, is there, and she didn't go with him because she went with Brad Pitt because he was cooler, I don't know, I'm making that part up. But he, you know, he, it's a big, big deal. Plus all these scientists and all these peers, both people that were for him and naysayers as well. So he's up there, and the whole idea was he was going to broadcast this signal from hundreds of miles away, and it was going to go to one of their sort of archaic versions of a telegraph-based printer, and then somebody was going to read out what was being said. It's like, wow, look at this ultra-cool, ultra-secure replacement for the telegraph. Well, this guy on the right, you probably don't recognize him. John Neville Mascalini. He was not a fan of Marconi. And he thought this whole idea about saying that radio was a secure wireless replacement to the telegraph was BS. He's like, it's absolutely not secure. Now, he's not as famous. He actually invented the pay toilet, not quite as, uh, quite as important as the radio. But uh, he set up a second radio tower. 
And he amplified the signal so that when Marconi's tower transmitted, John's signal overpowered it, and it's what showed up. So he's sitting in this auditorium, Marconi is. They're reading out what's coming across this telegraph, which was supposed to be all this stuff about Marconi and how great he is. And this is what came across. There was a young fellow of Italy who diddled the public quite prettily. <laughs> so Marconi didn't like that very much. But it sent a point that was like, look guys, radio, yeah, this cool new thing, but absolutely positively not a secure replacement for, for a wired telegraph. Right? And then we had mobile phones in the 1940s. Not like the mobile phones that all of us have in their, their pockets, right? These are mobile because you could put it on a steamship or the back of a flatbed truck. And then of course that showed us that we could have communication that went beyond standard telegraph and standard radio and carrier pigeons and whatnot. Then we get into this digital renaissance, right about when TCP IP kicked in in 1973, sort of HTTP, we had the PC, we had Ethernet, we had all these evolutions, social media, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, until we get to the pinnacle of civilization today, which we all know is skip intro on Netflix, right? I think we'd all agree that's the greatest thing we've ever created. But every time we have one of these quantum leaps, somebody tries to, to hack it or somebody tries to uh, exploit it in some way. And there's been a lot of examples of this throughout history, right? So the first example of people using the sea for trade was about 3000 BC, where they said, hey, we've got spices, you've got something else, let's stick this on a ship and we'll trade. First recorded time this happened was 3000 BC. The first recorded pirates didn't happen until 1300 BC, until somebody just said, hey Steve, why don't we just rob the ship? Now, we look at that now and that's not a huge idea, but back then it took, took a couple thousand years to come up with that. 1859, John Weiss said, I'm going to use this thing called the hot air balloon and use it, f I'm going to commercialize it, just like they commercialized the sea. We didn't have the first hijacking, which was in 1931, it was actually in Peru. 1962, first commercial satellite, just a couple of years after uh, um, Sputnik, and it was owned by AT&T, it was Telstar, it was used for television uh, broadcast. The Trula botnet, C2 communication, was using satellites to control that, didn't kick in until about 2015. Now, depending on who you're talking to in which country, they'd probably argue satellite warfare predated that a little bit. But that's really the first time we started seeing heavy uh, exploitation. And then, of course, Al Gore brought us the internet in 1988, as we all know. And that was roughly the exact same time as the Morris worm. And the threat window went down from thousands of years to zero. So as we expand, it actually goes, goes a lot quicker. Now, the birthplace for hacking, as I think everybody in this room knows, really goes back to, to phone freaking. And this guy's name was Joy Bubbles, and this is in the 60s. And he was blind, and he had a really unique technique. Uh, because he was blind, his way to communicate uh, with the world was through telephones. So he could whistle at certain frequencies. Um, and at the time, this was before System Signaling 7, when you had out of band, command and control, and then another band for voice for phone systems. So everything was through one channel. So if you picked up a phone, a regular phone or a pay phone, and you could hit the right frequencies, it would be just like you were the computer system doing what it was supposed to do. So he could whistle at 2600 hertz. Being able to whistle at 2600 hertz is the equivalent of like putting a coin in a pay phone which means you can make free phone calls. So that was pretty cool. You get this guy whistling and all of a sudden he's making these free phone calls and he can do all these neat phone tricks, phone freaking. Well, then this guy came around, Captain Crunch. His real name was John Draper. And he couldn't whistle at 2600 hertz, but he liked Captain Crunch cereal. And inside said cereal box was a prize that had a whistle. And that whistle created a frequency at 2600 hertz. Because of that, he could make free phone calls. But if you weren't as lucky as these two guys, you'd have to create a blue box. So Esquire magazine in 1971 printed this article about this box that you can make to do all these cool things. So somebody very famous, and probably all of us know of, took this idea, built these blue boxes, and used them. And that's Steve Wozniak holding a blue box right there, making some free phone calls. He used that to partially fund the very first Apple computer. So if it wasn't for joy bubbles, we might not have ever gotten to Apple, theoretically, right? That's a big leap, but let's just say it. Um, 
But definitely, I would not have gotten a chance to meet Steve Wozniak at the last Comic-Con with my family, which was pretty cool. And he's an awesome guy if you ever get to meet him, spend some time, because he is a joy. Um, then we had early malware kick in, right, from the 1970s through 2003-ish. Uh, the very first one was Creeper. It was designed for a digital equipment corporation computer, actually a PDP-10. Um, and it was called the Creeper. It was a self-replicating virus. It didn't really do anything malicious. It was just trying to see if you could write self-replicating code, and it found out we could. The term virus kicked in in 1983, but the first PC virus wasn't until 85. So that's kind of the historic background. But then the big one that really sort of started grabbing headlines was Code Red in 2001. And the thing that was cool about Code Red is it changed propagation from weeks and months to hours, right? And they said, wow, stuff can actually propagate pretty quickly. And if you look, the vulnerability was discovered on June 18th. The patch came out June 20th. That's pretty quick, two days, especially, you know, we're talking 2001. The exploit didn't kick in until July 12th, but it was still incredibly, incredibly effective. But the propagation rate is what made that interesting. And of course, SQL Slammer kicks in in 2003, and it was so effective that every eight and a half seconds, it doubled its infection rate. And within the first 10 minutes, about 90% of all accessible systems in the world were actually compromised. Right? So that's kind of our, our ancient history for us in, in our spot. Anybody hear the name Gary Ming before? So Gary Ming was a chemical engineer. He used to work for DuPont. And he worked for DuPont for about 10 years. And he decided he wanted to go work for a competitor. And DuPont only has a handful of competitors. This one happened to be in China. So during Gary's last few months with DuPont, he de decided to download a bunch of data. Data he was supposed to have access to, data he needed to have access to to do his job. But when they looked at the aggregate of the amount of information, R&D documents, product briefs, other research information, it was 15 times higher than all the other downloads of everybody else in DuPont combined. So unless you're a backup server, that's a hell of an anomaly. So that was enough information to bring in the Secret Service and some other groups, and they raided his home. When they raided his home, they discovered over $400 million worth of intellectual property. And to put that in perspective, that's about 8,000 Teslas. And everybody in this room knows anything more than about 7,500 Teslas is just being pretentious. <laughs> then we had another insider. And this is probably one of the biggest insiders of all time. This gentleman's name is Jerome Crevel. He worked for a French bank called Soc Gen, or Social Generale. Um, interesting thing about him, he was originally a, a developer, a software developer, and later started working uh, trading. So he was actually using the software that he had written. Over a period of time, doing some fake trades, hiding some money, one thing led to another, he actually stole $7 billion. So just a general, you know, pro tip, if you're going to steal a billion, go ahead and steal seven billion, right? It's, you're you're going to do the same time. Um, to put that in perspective, that's 140,000 Teslas, so super, super pretentious. So then we jump in 2011, and there was a case that I don't think really got as much publicity in the U.S. that it should. It certainly did in Asia, but it was called 10 Days of Rain, and when we were working on it, um, we tried to figure out why to call it, what to call it, and you'll see why we ended up calling it 10 Days of Rain. But it was, uh, it was spawned out of North Korea. So here's, here's kind of the story here. So North Korea was targeting South Korea with a multi-tier botnet. I think most of you here understand what multi-tier is, but if you have botnets that report to multiple managers, and those managers report to multiple managers, that makes it highly resilient, especially if you have uh, devices managing that botnet in countries that avoid takedowns, meaning I can call up people in the UK, I can call up people in Germany and Canada, and I can say, hey, I need you to take down this server, and they will, and we'll do it for them as well. But there's some places in the world where they don't. So if you have a highly distributed system like that, it makes it very hard to pull it down. So keep that in mind. It also used extremely heavy encryption, which isn't super rare, but but you'll see why that becomes important later. But we saw a lot of different encryption used. Now, the thing about encryption is it doesn't really do anything from a reverse engineering perspective, except for the fact that you have to execute everything dynamically. You can't do static analysis because it's encrypted. So you have to run it in order to process it. So it can be a little bit slower, at least historically it was. There's actually companies today that do that pretty well. Now, the code was written in a way that followed least privileges, 
which means A knew what B was doing, B didn't know what A was doing, C knew what they were both doing, you know, that typical military separation of duties design. So that kind of tells you it was written by somebody from a nation state background. Well, the next thing is, okay, we highly resilient, uses a lot of encryption, looks like it's designed by the military, right? All it did was DDoS. It was really, really dumb. It could only do one thing. And the type of DOS it did was silly. Things like ping of death, which is really, really cool like in 1998. Not that cool now in 2011 when this happened. DNS queries, HTTP request flooding, UDP flooding. Very, very basic kind of juvenile DDoS, right? The other thing is it didn't have a command interpreter. All it could do and all it could ever do was these stupid DDoS attacks. This really advanced code written to do this really stupid thing? That's like having a Ferrari and you use it for hauling firewood, right? Why? Why do, why do this? Then the system self-destructed after 10 days, hence 10 days of rain. Um, it didn't just destroy itself, it destroyed the computer it was sitting on, it over, overwrote the, the hard drive, et cetera, et cetera. Why would you build up a botnet army and then flush it? It doesn't make any sense. The idea is to get the biggest, baddest army. We've seen botnets, modern day botnets, that have more network bandwidth and processing capability than Amazon and Google combined. They are a force. So when you're talking about things like black hat search engine optimization, where I've got tens of thousands or millions of systems all pointing, hey, you just did a search on Drew Barrymore? Well, if I've got all these sites saying you should go to this server to look at Drew Barrymore, and that puts them high in the Google search process, and then you're more likely to get hit with their malware wherever they want you to do there. It's a very, very powerful tool, not just for phishing and things like that. But they killed it. Why would you kill it? So the question is why? So working with Interpol, working with the South Korean government and some others, what we basically found out was North Koreans didn't do this to South Korea for the attack of itself. They didn't care about the attack. What they were doing was monitoring how South Korea was responding. How soon before they detect it? How long before they reverse engineer it? What other government agencies around the world do they bring in? How effective are they if they try to take down something in Africa or Europe or Southeast Asia or the Middle East or the US? What's their process going to be? And they sit back and they measured their ability to respond. Now, at that point, we're like, well, what's coming now? Because now they've kind of charted out South Korea's skill set here. And the other shoe never dropped, right? There was no big event. There was no nuclear launch or thank God or anything crazy like that. So nothing that we know of um, had followed that. But this was certainly them just kind of poking them and seeing where the weak spots. Remember the first Jurassic Park when they had the T-Rexes kept on running, not the T-Rex, the Velociraptors kept on running against the fence looking for a weak spot so they could see where to go? That was kind of like this was. It was like a North Korean Velociraptor. Now, the interesting thing about nation states, when you're talking about this kind of code, is when you start digging into these attacks and you start looking at the perpetrators behind them, it's really an opaque line between who the cyber criminals are and who the nation state actors are. More often than not, in a lot of these countries, they're exactly the same people. And because of that, they're a nation state actor by day and cyber criminal at night. They use the same techniques. They use the same tools. They use the same services and things like that in the back end. It's because they have safe harbor. Because as long as they don't hack in their own country, whether that's Turkey or Iran or Russia, wherever, they're allowed to operate with safe harbor. And the reasons I have these pirates up here is in the 1600s, you had all these pirates that were hanging out in the Bahamas. They said, hey, look guys, you can come here to the Bahamas, you can come to our islands, you can live here, you can do all your pirate stuff, whatever pirates like to do, train parrots, carve peg legs, hide treasure, do all your cool pirate stuff. Every once in a while, though, we've got these pesky Spanish people that come by with their boats and try to take over things. If you could go out and shoot them, that would be awesome. And in return, stay here and do all your pirate stuff and things like that. That's the safe harbor clause. We're seeing that with the RBN, the Russian business networks. We're seeing that with people that are in Turkey that go ahead and they're sympathetic to the causes in Iran and they become expats over there and work over there. We're seeing this in other parts of the world as well. So again, nation state by day, cyber criminal at night, extremely, extremely common, especially in countries where there just aren't a lot of opportunities for people that are very technologically sophisticated. 
Now, cyber has become this massive equalizer, right? And there's this famous quote from um, uh, Samuel Colt, God made man, but Samuel Colt made him equal. He actually didn't say that, his PR agency did, but I always thought it was a cool saying. But the idea that cyber has become this ma massive equalizer, it's cheap, it's a lot cheaper than buying tanks and stealth fighters, low attribution, if you drive a tank across the border, most people are gonna know where you came from. Cyber attack is very easy to hide. It's easy relative to enriching uranium. And you don't need to be a nation state to launch an effective cyber campaign. You can be a minor actor. You can be a terrorist group. You can be a criminal organization. And it compresses space and time, right? It has much further reach than any bullet or any ICBM. Now we've seen technology shift advantage a bunch of times in the past. The Greeks, around 300 BC, they led the ancient world with bronze and iron and these phalanx units. And if you ever saw the movie 300, they were highly effective. As long as you were on flat terrain, you were marching in a straight line and you only had to go one direction. Then the Romans came around with this new thing called steel and they had this gladius sword, which was a Spanish, Spanish ripoff. Um, and they learned that they could attack from all these different angles. And they said, let's fight them in the trees. Let's flank them. Let's make them have to back up. And they sacked them. So today we look at the difference between steel and bronze and iron as pretty basic. And these fighting techniques as well were pretty basic. But that technology shifted advantage. And then we also see that complexity is by far a huge disadvantage. And what's more complex than most modern computing environments today? Some is cloud, some is in the data center. We've got some security tools here. People interacting, partner networks, all these other things. Highly complex. So in um, the 15th century, you had Turkey, back then the Ottoman Empire, and they had these Janissaries. And these guys didn't invent gunpowder, they didn't invent the musket, but they were the first group to really embrace and say, you know what, we're going to arm our military with muskets. And with this, they're going to be super, super effective. And they were. It cut through any kind of armor people were using against them. Somebody that had a longbow would take years to be effective. It takes you maybe a week to learn how to be effective with a musket. And everybody got armed with them. You get a musket, you get a musket, you get a musket, you get a musket. They all get a musket, except for this guy for some reason. He got a pointy stick. Nobody liked that guy. So that complexity got reduced. Even though it was more advanced technology, it was less complex. And then we look at World War II, right? In World War II, if you ever saw the movie Fury, on paper, the German Panther and Tiger tanks, way more effective, way more badass than anything we had with our U.S. Sherman tanks. The difference was it took a long time to train people to operate the Tiger tanks. And if something broke in the field, as inevitably it does with these types of things, especially when they're tuned like these Tiger tanks, they were like a clock, you had to have a supply chain to be able to back that up, which the Germans did not. The Sherman, if you could drive a car, you could drive the Sherman tank. It wasn't as powerful, it wasn't as effective, but it was a lot quicker to learn, a lot easier to use. The Russians were somewhere in the middle. Their tanks were a little bit better than that, not quite as good as the Tiger tanks, but they got to the point where they said, look, a tank's only gonna last three or four months before it gets blown up. We're not gonna worry about repairing it in the field with a supply chain. We're just gonna build at a high volume. We're not gonna paint it. You don't get a nice comfy chair. And eventually it got to the point because so many people were getting killed, they said, hey, after you're done building the tank, guess what? You're the person that's gonna be driving the tank. So eventually that complexity led to um, Thankfully, the, the Germans uh, getting their butts kicked, even though they had a much, much, much more advanced tank. Kind of an interesting uh, side story on this. The Germans in World War I had about 20 tanks. They didn't really believe in it. The French, the English had many, many more. We don't have a gift card for this one, but does anybody want to take a guess how many tanks and armored vehicles the Germans had in World War II? 160,000 from 20 to 160,000, none of which they were legally allowed to build. They built them telling people they were building tractors. And they built this little part in this factory, this little part in that factory, but this third factory is where they put it together and they had a tiger tank. They did the same thing with their Air Force as well. Just a little fun tip. So, we look at a lot of the countries today, especially the ones that U.S. has conflicts with, where are they armed with? AK-47s. There's about 100 million of these things out there. You can drive over them with a the truck, cover them with mud, dust them off, and they still fire fine. You can learn how to use an AK-47 in about 60 seconds. They're super, super simple to use, which is why a lot of kids use them around the world. Then you look at industrialized countries like the United States and our allies. We've got these drones, prompt global strike, all these other weaponry that you simply can't keep up with. So what are these countries to do? How do they mass a defense or an offense? 
So I spent some time in Vietnam. That's that top right corner. Um, when I was there, I was meeting with the Vietnamese Ministry of Defense. And they said, for the very first time now, they're spending more money on non-kinetic warfare than they are on kinetic warfare, which is a fancy way of saying we're putting more money into cyber than we are into bombs and bullets. That's a huge shift. Why? Well, who are they going to go to war with potentially? China, Russia, the United States? They're not going to outgun any of those countries. But they can out-cyber them is their perspective. The bottom right, this is uh, in South Korea. This is a group called the best of the best, as you can kind of see from there. Um, they have this hacking competition every year in South Korea. And South Korea, by the way, it's one of the most technologically sophisticated countries in the world. Everyone's online, very heavy STEM influence, very much part of their academic training. And every year they have this competition to find out the best hackers, high school through college age hackers. And they do basically capture the flag competitions. And then they take the best ones and they go into this best of the best program. Now, what's interesting about it is it's really hard to see her, but there's this 16-year-old girl here with a red hat. And they were telling me when she was at hers, they were basically in these big gymnasiums across the country. She was just sitting on her phone and playing video games because it's a 48-hour challenge and uh, not really doing anything. They're like, why is, this, why is this person even here? She's not even doing anything. Well, it turns out instead of hacking the systems and capturing the various flags, she was hacking the people who were hacking the systems to catch the various flags. And what she had done is she set up all the little USB chargers that were people were plugging all their stuff into. She set up everything like that. So everything that they were using was stuff that she had built and laid out on the table. So Steve goes, hey, I got three flags. And Bill says, I got, I got four. She goes, oh, I got 23. So pretty, pretty specialized. And the reason they have this, and by the way, they fund these guys once they come over to this group with tens of tens of millions of dollars. And they do it because they have a really, really crazy upstairs uncle in North Korea. Um, so that's pretty interesting. So you're seeing countries like this really embrace that. So for this $25 gift card, who can guess what country bought this aircraft carrier and is using it as their floating cyber warfare vessel? It's not China. It's not Israel. But keep on raising your hand. Yes, they're up there. No, I'll, and I'll narrow it down a little bit. It's in Latin America. Brazil. Okay, who's the first one that said Brazil? Okay, you, you get it. So afterwards, come up for the $25 gift card. So I was down in Brazil, and I was at basically their postgraduate naval warfare school. I don't exactly know what they call it there. And so this isn't a really cool aircraft carrier, by the way. This is a French 1963 aircraft carrier. So to put that in perspective, that's when the hit song Let's Go Surfing Now by the Beach Boys was number one. So it is old. It is really, really old. They only have a couple of jets that they bought from Kuwait, and they've got a handful of helicopters. They don't need an aircraft carrier. Nobody else in Latin America has an aircraft carrier. This was going to just be blown up with target practice, but they decided to buy it. They have now transferred it to a floating cyber warfare vessel, which is interesting because you either have to deal with hell of bad satellite latency or you have to have really long fiber optic cable. Certainly makes you a very easy target. But that's what they're doing with it. Why? Because they're not using the aircraft carrier to compete with traditional kinetic might. They're using it from a, a cyber perspective. So here's an interesting case. This was about 2015, and we're working with an oil and gas company. And they had suffered, unbeknownst to them for a couple years, a spear phishing campaign where they're going after their top executives. And after some forensic analysis, what it really looks like it turned out to be was they found out just through general social media that one of the executives had a daughter that played soccer. And a message got sent to him. I believe it was through email. It might have been through social media. They said, hey, Bob, I got a, a great photo of your daughter scoring a goal at the last game. What parent's not going to click on that, right? Unless you don't have a kid that plays soccer. Um, so they're going to click on that and open it. That was what looks like it was the initial infection. From there, it moved laterally throughout the organization. For two years, their executives had had their systems compromised, including the CEO. This included full access to their laptops. They had key loggers on there, every file they sent, every message. They jumped laterally into their SCADA control system so they knew how all their processes work. 
uh, if any of you work in the, in the petrochemical industry, as you, you might know, um, the, the intellectual property for those systems and how they process and the mixes and temperatures and all that, that's proprietary. That's kept in the programmable logic controllers and the historians and all the SCADA equipment. That's not stored in some Oracle database. So they got the IT and they got the OT side of the house, which is really interesting, for two years. Furthermore, they turned on the microphone and on the video camera for all the executives for two years. That's pretty powerful. And the reason I bring this up is when you're talking about oil and gas, it's a little different than hacking a, a hospital. They're both grievous things. But oil and gas, you start talking about fundamental shifts of power. This is something that can actually change maps and flags long term. Because think of it this way. If I'm company A, and I'm going to bid a billion dollars on some oil deposit that somebody just found off the coast of Rio de Janeiro, right? Somebody knows exactly what I bid, so what are they going to bid? A billion and one. Probably not quite like that. But it gives you a huge competitive advantage because a lot of these are done in private bids. So that's what we're starting to see now in some of this espionage. And I guarantee you that this wasn't a group that did this from a cyber crime perspective. There's much more of a nation state, state cause for this. But hacking into someone's system, turning on the microphone, turning on the video camera thing, these are all the things we see cyber criminals do too. Again, safe harbor, opaque lines, the same people. This is an interesting story. This is a company called American uh, Superconductor. Now, American Superconductor built the brains for these wind turbine systems, so basically the control systems. And pretty, pretty cool stuff, actually. It was self, self unencrypting as it ran. They put a lot of security measures in place. They started selling this in China. And when they started selling it in China, they partnered with a company called Cineville. And Cineville said, hey, American Superconductor, we'll install these turbines for you, we'll partner with you, and we'll do all this stuff. And they were doing great. They really built up the business. And then Cineville said, hey, you know what? Why don't we just cut out the middleman, and we're just going to build our own stuff, and, uh, and kind of uh, just take it from there and cut you out of the equation. The problem was they didn't have access to the source code that actually ran everything. So they needed to get access. So enter this guy over here on the left. He got wind that Cineville was looking for the source code. He was a, a European gentleman that was living in Asia at that time as a contractor, working for an super, American superconductor, helping Cineville. So he sends this message with his corporate email to Cineville. All girls need money. I need girls. Cineville needs me. Made it very clear what he was willing to do. And they stroked his ego. Oh, you're like Superman. You're so great. We're going to pay you. Blah, 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 blah. And they did. And he did give them the code. Now, this is what happened. Fast forward a year, American Superconductor had to lay off 600 employees and they lost over a billion dollars in share value because Cineville took it to market and they completely cut them out of the Asian market at that point. So a lawsuit was filed from American Superconductor against Cineville and against China because that always works out so well when you try to sue China. Uh, China brings in PLA Unit 61398, which is a pretty well-known group and we all, we all know them. Unfortunately, they got caught. So they used PLA Unit 61398 to hack into American Superconductor to figure out what kind of evidence do they have, what kind of forensics data, what kind of case are they mounting against China. Well, they got caught. So China fired them, and they brought in the Ministry of State Security, which is China's CIA, essentially. And China's CIA started poking around as well. Well, the sad part of this is insult to injury, that Cineville started selling these turbine systems, guess where? In the United States. They were selling them to municipalities. And the code was so similar that there were still comments in there from the American Superconductor guys, stuff like, hey, Bob, during the next release, make sure we change this section. Right? This guy, by the way, is uh, in jail for, uh, for trade secret violations. But just show you, that brought down an entire company, right? And more, more importantly, arguably, a company is a thing. All those people that work there and all those investors and everything. So very sad case. Now here's something, and I didn't know this before, but soybeans are like really, really important. And soybean crops um, arguably are, are the most important crop in the world because everything is made from soybeans, apparently. Um, there's a company I was working with, and I never know what to call them. We'll call them a chemical slash food slash agriculture company, I guess. Uh, half the world thinks they're poisoning the world, and the other half of the world thinks they're, they're saving the world. And the truth is usually somewhere in between. 
But they had the soybean crop that was controlled by SCADA, industrial control systems, PLCs, and things like that. And these PLCs are, a lot of these things are run like by Windows NT40. That has been end of life for like 17 years or whatever. And all they do is control basic things in physics, like set points. Um, our temperature can only get this high. You can only have this much UV light. You can have this much moisture. Those, those types of things. They only do three or four things. Um, but if you ping them, they fall over and die because they've been end of life for two decades. Now, the thing that was interesting here is these guys get hacked in all the time by nation states a lot because the nation states want to hack them because they want to steal the technology so they can go ahead and leverage it. They get hacked a lot by hacktivists because hacktivists think that they're killing the world and they just want to stop them. This particular hack was from a group of hacktivists. They had actually broken into their systems, specifically targeting their SCADA control systems. Now, in, in these worlds and, and discrete and batch manufacturing, anything that uses SCADA, there's three zones. There's the IT zone, which is traditionally what we're all familiar with. There's the SCADA zone, which is a management zone, which manages the industrial control system zones, which are these PLCs and these controllers that operate these, these systems. So they got into the SCADA zone, and they made modifications that said, hey, no matter how high the temperature gets, if the set point is set to 90 degrees, let's bump that thing up to 150 degrees, and things will still go. Well, this was a multi-billion dollar project they were invested in, and they changed these set points, and the temperature kept on rising, but alerts weren't going off. It kept on rising, it kept on rising and rising and rising, and they were within two hours of losing this entire crop, and it was just found by accident because somebody was working with them going, it is way too hot in here. It's just way too hot in here. I don't know what the systems are telling you, but I'm sweating. And they actually figured it out and stopped it. But that was a multi-billion dollar investment that was almost brought down because someone just modified a set point, which is a relatively simple thing to do on those types of controls. Now here's an interesting uh, thing. We're all familiar with WannaCry and it had all these variants and things of that nature. So there's a picture of John Dillinger right here. He was a bank robber in the 1930s. And these are the guys that actually caught him. I, I always thought that was a pretty funny, cocky picture after they caught him. Um, but he would get his guns, and he would steal flak jackets and ammunition and things like that from a very specific area. Does anybody know who he used to rob? Police stations, because they had all the guns. He would rob police stations. And he once broke out of jail with a fake wooden gun. So he's a pretty interesting guy. Um, but the reason I have him up there with WannaCry, so for $25 gift card, who thinks I should, why I had John Dillinger up here with WannaCry, the guy who used to rob police stations? Yes, sir? Close, you're getting there? Yes, sir? Is it because it's based on the leakage from the NSA? Exactly. So WannaCry was built atop Eternal Blue. Eternal Blue was stolen from the NSA. Then it was weaponized and released through shadow brokers. Fast forward about six months, and over 250,000 instances of ransomware and related attacks across 150 countries. It's like John Dillinger, just in a, in a cyber perspective, right? And then you had all these other things that came out, like NotPetya. Not patch a completely different attack than WannaCry, but exactly the same underlying code. Oh, I'm sorry, not code, but underlying um, process. So 2018, we've been hearing this a lot. Well, we don't have to worry about any of this stuff because we're in the cloud. Or we don't have to worry about any of this stuff because we're MSSP. And that always makes me chuckle and makes me sad all at once. Um, but in the cloud, the thing about the cloud, and there's so many things we can all say about the cloud, is in a data center, it's pretty hard to say, here's my Apache web server, and here's my backend database. And I'm going to accidentally plug it in on the wrong side of the firewall or the wrong side of the WAF. I physically could, but the routing and everything, it's, it's probably not going to work that well. It's relatively simple in a cloud environment with a couple of wrong... keystrokes to have your segmentation wrong and have all your critical assets unprotected on the wrong side. Not that you did it intentionally, it's just that it's a relatively simple mistake. And a lot of these hacks in the cloud that you see aren't hacks just because they were instrumented incorrectly and they're sitting on the wrong side. Now the other thing, MSSP, I had this story I'll share. This was with an insurance company. So 
we went in there and we did some evaluations of their security controls to see how effective they were. And we ran a bunch of attacks and were they detected, were they prevented, did they get correlated alerts, all this. And nothing was prevented. Um, a couple things got detected, probably about 4 or 5%. Um, not, not really great, great results. And we, we presented this to the CISO of this company who was just like shocked. He's like, well, what the heck is our MSSP doing? They're not doing anything. So he goes, well, you guys get on a call with us and this MSSP. So this CSO was pretty upset, so they brought the CEO of this MSSP on this conference call. So the CSO of the insurance company, me and a couple other folks from Baradin, and the CEO of MSSP, a well-known MSSP, a good MSSP, really. And uh, the CSO just, just ripped into him for a good 15, 20 minutes. It felt like five hours. It was really uncomfortable. And uh, the CEO listened, and he took it, and he took it. And the big thing the, C the CISO said was like, and you didn't stop one attack. And the CEO goes, uh, you're not paying us for prevention. We just do detection. And if you read your SLAs and contracts, we've never done prevention for you. Should you like to do prevention, we can go ahead and talk about that. That's an additional service. For years, this company operated under the false belief that this MSSP was providing preventative controls in addition to incident detection. And that's, not a, that's just a, not looking at your contracts correctly. Now, in the CISO's defense, he was only there for a few months, and he inherited this from another CISO. So he made an assumption, and that assumption was incorrect. Um, but those types of things happen, too. It's not just the technical side. It happens on the business side. Um, and lately, this has actually been happening. I saw a lot of this at the end of last year, too. But certainly going into this year, I'm seeing this. This idea of environmental drift. This idea that something was working, and now it just stopped working. Uh, like the train was on the track, and now all of a sudden the train is not on the track. And some examples that I've seen is uh, they set up a proxy server in this one, for this one retailer, and all the syslog messages that were going into their SIM just stopped going into their SIM. But nobody told the security team this. So from their perspective, they're like, wow, there just hasn't been a lot of activity. Things are just slow. I guess everything's OK, because there's not a lot of stuff going into my SIM. Um, but notes to them, there should have been a lot of stuff going into their SIM. But it wasn't because it was being blocked, and it got implemented by the infrastructure team that never communicated this change to the security team. Well, that's a problem, because sometimes you have people making these changes without actually telling the security team. Another issue we saw is we saw somebody that spent $14.5 million on a network-based anti-malware solution. Big, big investment. And a great tool, actually. It wasn't a bad tool at all. But when it was during POC, it was working great. But over time, somebody modified one of the taps. It was only looking at unidirectional traffic. When this particular system was deployed, if it's not seeing bidirectional traffic, it just sees unidirectional traffic, it drops everything because it can't put the session together. It was a $14.5 million paperweight that had been sitting there for months, providing zero value because literally of a $5 issue that took all of 30 seconds to fix, right? And these types of things happen. Environmental drift, something that was working, has stopped working. Another one we see all the time, and I know this has never happened to any of you, but somebody will change a rule or something like that, a, a firewall rule, an ACL, make some type of modification to run some tests, and they forgot to change it back to where it was before. I'm sure that's never happened to anybody here. Um, one such case was there were some changes that were made by the networking team on their perimeter firewalls, because they were doing some testing. And essentially, they were then able to get ICMP out of the network. And this team didn't even know that things like data exfiltration was possible via ICMP. The security team knew. And they found out that all of a sudden, they had a vulnerability where data could, in fact, be exfiltrated via ICMP, undetected, unprevented, and unalerted, just because somebody made a simple change to do some testing and just never changed it back. And then this thing. You know, you install a patch on a system without doing, you know, we always talk about, oh, we've got to patch that on our application web server, or we've got to test this patch on our, on our database server uh, before it goes live, so we, we do some testing. We don't often do that on the security side. And we found out, well, wow, this was doing a really good job at stopping Mimikatz until I patched it, and now it's not stopping Mimikatz at all. Well, that's a problem. The EDR is probably fine, but maybe because of some little tweak or configuration. So we see this environmental drift causing a lot of big problems. And, you know, I, I like to use this, I mentioned this at the very beginning, this whole notion of the digital renaissance, right? Start, that started, you know, in 73-ish with TCP IP. But there's been lots of good and lots of bad that came out of the renaissance, the traditional renaissance, and that's come out of the digital renaissance. 
So if I quickly, a quick little historical journey here. You know, in about 2300 BC, you know, they had the scratch plow. And that could allow you to plant about enough food to feed your family. Around 900 AD, they actually found one of these in Italy, they had the heavy plow. And the heavy plow lets you go deeper, you can, you can pull up the rich clay, it was more nutrient rich. End result is you plant more food than you can eat. And if you have more food than you can eat, what do you do? You sell the extra food. And if you've got a lot of people with extra food, you start having people come together and you build cities, and that's why you see the Renaissance starting in the 1300s, mostly in Florence and Rome and Milan, um, but in other places around, around Europe as well. Now, this was a cool thing. So people started coming to the cities for trade and jobs and food and security and all these great things. They said, hey, this new city living is pretty awesome. Right? And then he had all these monks. These monks were sitting around writing all these books. Not books like we think of today. You had to have people that would tan skins, people that were scribes, people mix ink. You would adorn them with gold and gems and ivory. Right? You'd have people that would draw the pictures and they would take years to make and they're owned by the, only the ultra rich. Well, that was the good side of the Renaissance, right? The dark side of this is when you had all these people come to the city, nobody really knew about germs and bacteria and viruses and things like that. So they would take all their waste and just throw it out the window. They knew probably don't drink water that has a bunch of poop floating in it. But once you get past that point, they didn't really know a lot. So you had typhoid and cholera, the measles, right? Then you had these rats that were carrying fleas that were getting on ships from the Caspian and the Black Sea or coming across the Silk Road from Asia, especially... Um, especially some of the ones in, in China, and they would get, get on these trade ships or on these trade routes, and they'd show up, and guess what these fleas carried? The plague. And it ended up killing a third of the global population. And this is before mass transportation and all that, of course. Pretty, pretty horrific stuff. So you had all the good of the Renaissance plus all of the bad. But then the outcome was this, is all those monks and everybody that used to make those books, guess what? They're all dead. And Gutenberg, this blacksmith, said, hey, I see a business opportunity here. Why don't I develop this Gutenberg press so I can have one machine make 800 or make um, 3,600 pages a day juxtaposed to 10 to 40 pages a day? Well, that was pretty cool. Now I can have multiple machines and multiple print shops. And then what happens? Literacy booms. After a few decades, now all of a sudden you have more books. You don't have to be ultra rich. People could read. It led to this massive investment in STEM. People started finding out about that time period that, hey, it's really hard to read. I think I need glasses. Glasses were actually invented in the 1200s, not by Ben Franklin. He invented bifocals in the 1200s, but they didn't really get embraced till the 1500s because people never knew they were hard of seeing because they were never reading before. And that advancement in optics and how prolific it was led to microscopes and telescopes and things like that and all these advances in art and science. And by the end of the Renaissance in the 1600, you had clocks and champagne and whiskey and flushable toilets, not the pay toilets that we talked about before, but flushable toilets, steam engines, and all these things came out of that. So all this goodness came from all that bad. And then the cities adopted um, new public safety things. They said, hey, let's, uh, let's stick the garbage over here. Let's put the food supply and the water over here. And let's screen people that are coming in. If they're like turning black and they're covered with warts, let, let's not have them in the center of town maybe. So they started thinking through this process, right? So now we look at the digital renaissance today. We see a lot of similarities, right? We converged on cities. We converged on the internet for the exact same reasons. Entertainment, work, art, science, communication. Same exact reasons. Then, just like the renaissance, we have all these issues, espionage and malware and ransomware and sabotage and all these problems. So we respond. And we respond with endpoint security and cloud and network and email security and all these different controls. But honestly, it's still not very effective. And it's not effective primarily because we have assumption-based security. We did this study uh, at Veriden, and it's just a free, free thing. You can download a free report, the Veriden Security Effectiveness Report, where we looked at companies. 25% a people's security controls, or I'm sorry, 25% of the time across endpoint network email and cloud security controls, attacks are actually being prevented. They're being prevented 25% of the time. Not because you have bad tech, not because you have bad people, but you've never taken the time or had the tools or the capability to validate, is my firewall actually doing what I expect? Is my endpoint doing what I expect? Is my IPS detecting? Is my SIM cor correlating? About half the time, detection works. You don't even know you're getting hit, let alone it being stopped. And this one breaks my heart after about seven years at ArcSight. 22% of the time, correlation actually works. 
And to be very honest with you, that's being very liberal. We found some cases where it was closer to like 3 or 4%. Because you write these very, very detailed correlation rules based on volumetric and temporal analysis and, and pattern discovery and anomaly detection. We have no idea if it's actually going to work until the actual thing happens. Is the underlying infrastructure going to report correctly? Is NTP all ganked up? All these other problems that can occur. And the result is, we don't have really any way to validate and rationalize what we have. We don't know what's working, what's not, where to prioritize, where to invest, and what to retire. We have limited security value from our tools, but we keep on putting time, money, and resources, hoping that some silver bullet will pick it, instead of saying, let's get value out of the stuff we've already invested in. Like that case we talked about, $14.5 million on a network-based security product that was doing nothing because of a $5 configuration error. And worse off, those of you out here that are in a security leadership position, you're not armed with the information you need to do your jobs correctly, nor communicate to your bosses so they can do their jobs more effectively. So it's this horrible cycle that we've gotten into. So this one's for another, another $25 gift card. So in the 1930s, two things made bank robbers really effective. The first thing was fast cars with V8 engines, usually Fords. The second thing was the interstate highway system. You could rob a bank in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and if you can make it across the border to Texas, you were home free. And you're home free because at that time, robbing a bank was not a federal crime. In fact, there were no federal crimes. Federal crimes didn't kick in until like the Lindbergh baby kidnapping. They made kidnapping a crime, etc. So bank robbers were highly, highly effective back then in the 1930s. Now, for the $25 gift card, and I'll give you a tough couple clues because I'm going to ask you to, if you can name who these folks are. This guy here, his name is Mickey Cochran. He became a manager for the Detroit Tigers. Don't worry about him. It's not important to my story. One of these guys we've already talked about, and one of them you can skip. So for $25, who would like to take a shot and name who these folks are? Again, this is the early 1930s. Uh, wait, raise your hand. Who? Okay, go ahead, sir. J. Edgar Hoover? Yep. Right here with the Tommy gun? Uh, uh, close, close. Uh, who wants to take another shot? Y yes, sir, up there. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Did you did you want to take a shot at? Let's let's let this gentleman with his hand up in the back by the exit sign. Go ahead. Okay. Yep. Do you want to do them all or just that one? Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Correct. Very. I'll give that one to you. That's Baby Face Nelson. Everybody gets that one wrong. That's pretty awesome. Hey, good job. You get the twenty-five dollar gift card. How's it going? On? That's a hard one, right? So here, here's the thing. At this point, so Hoover goes. How much time? Yeah. So Jagger Hoover goes to FDR and he goes, "Look, we have to make bank robbery a federal crime," and this was. This is when the government was small. This is not the massive, huge U.S. government that we know today. And this was before the New Deal. So Hoover goes to FDR. He says, we got to make bank robbery a federal crime because all these guys are kicking our butts, right? So what happens at this point is they go, OK, Hoover will do it. So in February of 1934, they make the Federal Bank Robbery Act. And Hoover says to FDR, and by the way, as part of this expansion government, I want you to change the uh, Bureau of Investigation to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Back then it wasn't the FBI because it wasn't federal. He goes, no, 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 that's stupid. Why would we ever want to do that, Hoover? Let's just make this a federal crime and we'll see where it takes us. He says, okay. So right after that act, Bonnie and Clyde killed May 1934. Dillinger killed. Um, ba Babyface was killed. All these guys get killed at a very short period of time. And based on that, FDR said, all right, you got it, 1935, we'll make it the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And he got what he wanted. And that's what comes from there. The point of this is they changed the game. They said, if you could rob a bank in Oklahoma because of fast V8 engine cars and the interstate highway system and make it across the border, we need to change the game. Well, the same thing applies in cyber. The amount of time and money and resources that we're putting into cybersecurity isn't making us more effective. And it's fundamentally because we're basing things on assumptions, right? We're not measuring, we're not providing evidence. Yeah, we do pen testing and red teaming, we do patching, 
But if that's what we're going to do, why the hell are we buying all these security tools, right? The whole notion here was so we don't have to assume. We don't have to assume if our technology is doing what the vendor said. I mean, I, mean, I know ve no vendor would ever go above their skis a little bit and say that they can do all these things, and maybe there's something they don't do that well. That happens sometimes. We don't want to have to assume that we've deployed it correctly, and we configured it correctly, and it's been optimized, and it's providing value, or our people and our processes work, or that thing that was working last week is working this week, that environmental drift story that we talked about before. So I fundamentally feel we have to think of something that's not just better, but different. Not the next best firewall, the next best IPS, the next best SIM, but something fundamentally different. So we can, one, identify where the gaps are in my security controls. Not that Apache has this vulnerability or Oracle doesn't have this patch, but actually validate the effectiveness of my security controls. If it's not doing what I want, I want to be able to prescriptively tune it. Tell me what I need to do to fix that security control. Then let me provide security assurance to know, hey, that thing I did is actually doing what I want by retesting it and revalidating it. And then I want to be able to test that over time. So now that I've created a new baseline of what's working, and I've got it tuned and optimized, and most of my controls are operating how they want, I want to have that automated and tested every single day. And if something that was green turns red, let me know. And then let me go ahead and take it to the next level where now I can communicate to my bosses and empirically say, we need to spend $2 million on DLP. Why? Because I have empiric evidence that we can exfiltrate data from here to here. We're not blocking it. We're not detecting it. We're not doing anything with it. And if you think this is a $2 million problem, let's invest. And here's some freeware software that you can leverage to do some of this types of testing. Endgame has some, MITRE, Uber, Red Canary. They do what's called breach and attack simulation, and there's some free versions of that. And there's some pay for stuff too that takes that and really builds upon it, things like the Veritas Security Instrumentation Platform. But the last slide I'll leave you here today is Malcolm Harkins, the CISO for Silence, wrote a book where he's talking about the need to protect to enable. The security industry has no economic motivation to solve all your problems. In fact, they're incentivized by the insecurity of things, right? So you need to kind of focus on the idea of how can I leverage security to enable my business and understand that it's not about cyber risk, but our jobs are